the idea that Putin's all bad and we're all wonderful. That's our narrative every day. That's so deadly. I could not believe a president of the United States would say such an idiotic thing. It could not be stupider. Since February 24th, 2022, Putin and Biden have not spoken one time. Disagree, yell at each other, but talk with each other. Professor Sachs, many thanks uh, for your time. Many thanks uh, uh, for being here. Just to uh, to uh, start it off for our viewers, our readers, you have once been named, I think, by the New York Times as uh, probably the most important economist in the world. Who are you uh, to describe you, just to give our readers and viewers an idea of who you are? Um, what are some milestones and important uh, you know, uh, elements of your life that we can understand you? I, I've been a professor for 43 years. Uh, 22 of those were at Harvard University and uh, 21 at Columbia University. At Harvard, I uh, taught economics. At Columbia, I have taught sustainable development. In other words, a more uh, integrated uh, program of economics, politics, uh, and environment. Uh, I've been advisor to three secretaries general of the UN, Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon, uh, and uh, Antonio Guterres. And I lead a worldwide network of universities and think tanks called the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network to promote sustainable development especially the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. I've worked in more than 130 countries and have advised uh, dozens of heads of state and uh, finance ministers. Uh, and I had the uh, honor to advise uh, President uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, President Yeltsin, and uh, Ukraine's first uh, president of independent Ukraine, President Kuchma. Uh, so I go back now more than 30 years uh, to the Russia, Ukraine, US issues. I've been watching this and more than that involved in these issues for more than 30 years. Well, professors say they're uh, into uh, science, of course, so they don't like uh, the question of be or being asked where do you stand politically? But still, every human being has some kind of a political standpoint. Where would you situate yourself? I am an Aristotelian, uh, meaning that I follow Aristotle's uh, ethics and politics. Uh, he believed that politics should be organized for the common good, that the purpose of politics is to promote well-being, or eudaimonia, as the Greeks called it. Uh, that this requires uh, the exercise of our rationality, uh, and uh, that's what I aspire to do. I am uh, an opponent, I would say, of the British empiricist tradition of Hobbes, Locke, uh, and uh, Smith uh, in their various ways, uh, because Hobbes believed that uh, human nature was uh, intrinsically incorrigible. Uh, Locke believed that the purpose of government was the protection of private property, and Adam Smith believed that a free market system was providential. Uh, and uh, the British bequeathed uh, to us uh, the economics profession itself, the one I was trained in. Uh, so I was trained in British empiricist philosophy, uh, and it took me uh, many decades to <laughs> outgrow it, I would say, and to understand all of the peculiarities and biases uh, that uh, came with my graduate school training at Harvard University. <laughs> you have just spent, I think, one year in Europe, in Vienna, and uh, yes. in, in, in some other places. What uh, is the most important take uh, you have from this uh, stay in Europe? What's your dominant impression of the state of Europe? I was very disappointed because uh, most of Europe's leaders are 
right now simply following whatever the United States says uh, and uh, whether this is because of their belief in Europe's security, uh, whether it's uh, their belief that the US will punish them if they deviate from the line. Uh, the state of European politics is uh, quite bad and the war has made things uh, worse uh, because uh, Europe is with a dominant narrative like the United States that is uh, basically uh, given by the US security establishment and then repeated in the mainstream media in Europe. So it was at a political level, really disappointing. At a, at a personal level, it was wonderful. Uh, Vienna is a fantastic place. Uh, it is uh, the result of uh, decades of social democratic philosophy and ethos and social housing. And uh, we had a fabulous time. And I also came to admire more and more the wise decision uh, of both the uh, Soviet Union and uh, Austria in 1955 to uh, make a, a very good deal that the Soviets would leave uh, Austria and the Austrians would declare neutrality uh, and uh, that this would be the basis going forward. And it proved its great worth. And I tried to sell that approach for free <laughs> to give the advice to Ukraine uh, repeatedly, but they didn't understand that it's much better to be a neutral Austria than a NATO aspirant uh, partner of the United States. Uh, you know, as Henry Kissinger famously said, uh, to be an enemy of the United States is uh, dangerous, but to be a friend uh, is fatal. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Ukraine has uh, uh, believed that the U.S. is going to provide security and what the U.S. is uh, providing is the uh, dismemberment of Ukraine. Your Austrian neutrality makes uh, us Swiss a little bit proud because in the Constitution of Austria, it says, uh, they want to have a neutrality Swiss style. Oh, uh, I didn't realize relate? that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that uh, Switzerland was the role model for for neutrality in in uh, in, in Austria. What's your relationship and this is, with Switzerland? And this you know, is, Switzerland, of course, extremely smart, and it served Switzerland very well. It served Austria very well, and ironically, it served uh, Sweden and, and Finland very well. And they abandoned this. Uh, this year, shockingly, naively, uh, thinking that Russia is about to invade Finland or Sweden. No. Uh, and all of the benefits of neutrality, they gave up overnight uh, because of these right wing parties that don't understand or pretend not to understand the current geopolitics. Even in Switzerland, there are uh, people in the establishment who think that neutrality has to be given up or neutrality has to be made more flexible, that Switzerland can deliver weapons to one uh, party in the war. What do you say about that? I mean, as a, yeah, what's your, what's your take on that? I mean, should Switzerland give up neutrality? Would that be a wise uh, course? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing more to add. Switzerland's one of the most successful countries of modern history. Why would you give up the basis of success? Yeah. As, as Goethe said, said, nichts ist schwerer zu ertragen als eine Folge von guten Tagen. Good days are hard to bear. And sometimes if you're very successful, <laughs> you start to forget what made you successful. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> Every day I walk by Goethe in, uh, on the Ringstrasse in Vienna because he's got oh. a big statue just uh, near the uh, opera house. Uh, and so I paid uh, respect to Goethe every day. <laughs> so. uh, okay. Yeah, um, you, have, you have been commenting, of course, that the war in Ukraine in the recent months um, extensively. How, how do you assess the situation at the moment? Give us a brief uh, oversight of your uh, perception. I think it's uh, probably accurate or roughly accurate that about 40,000 Ukrainians have died in the last two months of uh, what is a failed counteroffensive promoted by the United States. So this has been a disastrous period. 
Ukraine will not achieve on the battlefield its goals. This was clear from the very beginning, but uh, the U.S. has always said otherwise. And remember, I'm 68 years old, so I've heard the fairy tales of uh, U.S. generals for uh, more than six decades. Uh, they always say, yes, uh, success is just around the corner. This next offensive is going to be great. The surge is going to be decisive uh, and so forth. So I've heard this so many times in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Nicaragua, Iraq, Syria, Libya, uh, and heard it again in Ukraine. Uh, what's very sad is that Ukraine is being destroyed in this process uh, because uh, the U.S. has wanted to push Ukraine to NATO and Russia for completely predictable uh, and understandable reasons said no. And uh, the United States believed that Russia was bluffing or that if not bluffing, that it had no alternative but to bend to the U.S. will. And uh, this has not been the case. And uh, Biden is not a very clever man, unfortunately, and his team is not very clever. Uh, Obama was more clever than Biden. And Obama knew in 2014, though Obama helped to start this disaster uh, when uh, the U.S. helped to overthrow Yanukovych, Biden, uh, Obama knew at that time, don't go deeper into this. Because as he said in an interview, Russia has escalatory dominance. Whatever we do, Russia will escalate. And the reason is, for Russia, this is existential. For the United States, it's it's nice. Wouldn't it be nice if Ukraine were in NATO? We would control the Black Sea. That's nice. But for Russia, it's absolutely existential. And so uh, Obama already understood in 2014, don't escalate because Russia will continue to escalate. You can't bluff Russia out of this. Biden, who's not very clever, just uh, thought, well, what will Putin do? We'll just keep pushing. Uh, and uh, when Putin put on the table in December 2021, a draft agreement for security arrangements we, between the US and Russia, by the way, I called the White House to say, <laughs> negotiate, this is absolutely negotiable. I was told, no, 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 we're not gonna negotiate. And the US told Russia, no, not interested in negotiating. NATO is none of your business. Mm -hmm. It was literally the line. And Putin said, you know, it is my business and, and has shown it. And uh, this is a complete disaster for Ukraine. Probably the population has been, has declined by maybe 10 million from emigres on the one hand or the Russia controlled territory on the other hand. And uh, the bloodbath continues and NATO has, I won't even say NATO, this is a, a small group in the US leadership. They have no answer, but they have the election coming up in November, 2024. So they need to, they think they need to continue this uh, so as not to show weakness or defeat. This is where we are right now. It's a complete tragedy for Ukraine. How will it play out? I mean, it's always hard to say, of course, to look into the future. But what is the most probable outcome you see in this war? There will be ongoing large-scale killing and destruction uh, until... Uh, honesty prevails and honesty will mean that the U.S. will be clear that NATO enlargement to Ukraine is not going to take place and not going to happen and it's not an objective and then the fighting will stop and when the fighting stops uh, there will be major territorial issues. One I think was uh, fated from the beginning, and that is that Crimea will remain in Russian hands as it was and has continued to be Russia's naval base in Sevastopol since 1783. 
it's not going to Ukraine uh, other than uh, it's not going to Ukraine, period. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the issues of uh, the Donbass and uh, Kherson uh, district and uh, Zaporizhia, this is really a mess right now because at, in December 2021, we should remember Russia was making no territorial claims, even for the Donbass. What Russia was calling for was honoring the Minsk agreements. And the US stupidly and Ukraine stupidly wouldn't honor agreements that had been signed and backed unanimously by the UN Security Council. Well, Russia is now dismantling the country geographically. And with so many losses on the Russian side, the belief that, well, okay, uh, we'll just go back to uh, where we were is, 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 is a little naive. So this is a mess. Uh, I don't have a, any clear mm -hmm. answer. What I've said every day from uh, December 2021 until now is sit down and negotiate because it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, Ukrainians are dying at a rate of maybe a thousand a day right now or a thousand dead and seriously wounded. And this is absolutely disastrous. The dominant narrative, even in Switzerland, in the German speaking part of Europe, I don't know, probably also in the United States, is that Putin is trying to reassemble the Soviet Union. His plan is to create the greater Russia and to negotiate with Putin would be appeasement uh, policy, which was doomed uh, against Hitler. These historical analogies are being made. Why is this narrative wrong in your eyes? Well, because the real context is that the American empire is the one that keeps expanding or the in intention of it. And by you know, that's a, a provocative phrase that uh, Americans are not allowed to say. But the American military alliance, NATO, uh, is the active agent here of expansion. Uh, and uh, this counters all that was said to Gorbachev in 1990. It's a direct violation of common sense, as well as commitments that were made back in 1990, that as the Soviet Union dismantled the Warsaw Pact, NATO would not take advantage of that in any way. And of course, the famous expression was not one inch eastward. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the Soviet Union ended, I was actually in the room in the Kremlin when that happened because mm -hmm. I was advisor to Boris Yeltsin. So this is for me, not only history books, but uh, being there, uh, the United States, unbeknownst, of course, to me and to the world at the time, because everything is done secretly, uh, said, okay, now we start expanding NATO. Uh, and from uh, the early 1990s onward, this was set in motion. And our top diplomats warned repeatedly don't do that. Our greatest diplomat of the age, George Kennan, after all, the author of containment itself mm -hmm. in 1947, said, do not expand NATO. Our Secretary of Defense at the time, William Perry, said, do not do this. Our ambassador to the Soviet Union, Jack Matlock, a wonderful diplomat, said, do not do this. This will start us down a path of new confrontation. What's interesting is that for the first few years, the first wave of expansion, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, I think Russia was very unhappy, but said, okay, that's Central Europe. But then the next swath under George W. Bush Jr. was, of course, right against the Black Sea. Bulgaria, Romania, the Baltic states, Slovakia and Slovenia, seven in one wave. The Russians said, you know, stop this already. And 
Putin went to uh, the Munich Security Conference in 2007, mm -hmm. people should read the speech. Of course, not only do they not read the speech, our mainstream media absolutely tried to deflect us from any history, from any memory, from any context. But Putin said, stop expanding. You promised us no expansion. Now you keep expanding. And this is extraordinarily dangerous for our national security, what you're doing. So mm -hmm. what was the US response? In 2008, George W. Bush Jr. insisted that Ukraine, that uh, NATO will go not only to Ukraine, but to Georgia. Okay, now it turns out this was part of a, a timeline that was already deeply set. This wasn't just George W. Bush Jr., though he didn't have to follow through. Zbig Brzezinski explained all of this in Foreign Affairs magazine in 1997 in an article called Strategy for Eurasia. He even gave the timetable. He said Ukraine's membership will come between 2005 and 2010. And if you're experienced in US politics, you know an article in Foreign Affairs like that is not just some author's uh, thinking, it's a reflection of what is in train. Little bit trial balloon, but mainly explanation of the, the timeline. Now, in 2008, European leaders were aghast at what Bush had done. And some of them talked to me. And Angela they told Merkel. me. Angela not, Merkel. Not, said, not Angela Merkel personally, but no. Said, but she said nope. at the time, if uh, Ukraine would be part of NATO, this would be a cause for war, of war for Russia. Even Merkel so, said it. Exactly. So this was all known. And what is so sad about the European leaders is none of them tells the truth right now. They're all so scared of the United States or of their public or of the ability to manipulate uh, the mass media and the perception from below or to speak out of line. But I know what they said because they said it to me. What's they said your... it to me personally. And by mm -hmm. the way, just as recently as a few weeks ago, one of Europe's top leaders, mm -hmm. I said to him, uh, I won't go farther to say who, but I yeah. said, you know, the day Biden says NATO's not enlarging, then we really can get to the end of the war. And he said to me, I agree with you completely. And then he said exactly the opposite the next day, by the way, in public. So I know it from my own uh, view. So this story, just to finish the story, <coughs> the disaster, the, <coughs> the fuse was lit in 2008. But then the US cannot stop playing games. That's the biggest problem. US foreign policy is covert. It's not that you can't figure it out, but it's secret, it's deniable. And so what happens in 2014 in February, the United States, together with right-wing nationalists in Ukraine, work together to overthrow Yanukovych. Clear as can be, and not only that, Thanks to uh, the services of, uh, of Russia, uh, we even have it on tape uh, with Victoria Nuland talking to uh, U.S. Ambassador Jeffrey Piat about who the next government will be. Mm -hmm. Basically four weeks before Yanukovych is violently overthrown. And they pick the next prime minister and explain why. It can't be Klitschko, it's got to be this one. And it just went down that way. And our newspapers, oh, they won't say a word about it. It's on tape. Oh, that doesn't matter. We can ignore it. We can ignore everything. So that's when the explosion came. The war started with the overthrow of the Yanukovych government. Now, oh, so many people, Sachs, you know, what a Putin apologist, what a conspiracy theorist. Of course, people... If you don't look a little bit or people don't tell you things, 
then you don't know. But let me advise uh, people just for example, there, there's a very nice book written by a very fine scholar uh, in 2017 called Covert Regime Change. And it's about US foreign policy from 1947 to 1989. And it documents 64 covert regime change operations of the US government. So that's the business of the US government overthrowing other governments. They're called covert, but there's a lot of trace. I've been actually in places where governments have been overthrown. I watched and mm -hmm. then I see that the New York Times won't even report the story because it's a game from the US point of view. So mm -hmm. in February 2014, the US again engaged in a regime change operation and thought we can get away with it. Now we have a pro-NATO government. We've just overthrown the neutral government. Now we have a pro-NATO government. And immediately the new government says, yeah, we want to join NATO. And immediately the arms flows start from the United States, billions of dollars of arms flows. And this continues through Trump. It continues through the uprisings uh, in uh, the Donbass. It, it continues uh, with the Russia taking back Crimea. And then in 2021, we have a new president who some of us thought would be sane and responsible. He's probably sane, he's, but he's completely irresponsible. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, three times in 2021, the United States government recommitted to Ukraine's membership in NATO at the highest levels in big security documents, as well as in the NATO summit in 2021. And mm -hmm. that's when Putin put on the table at the end of 2021, a draft agreement for new security arrangements between the US and Russia. And Putin kept saying, by the way, look, you, you're putting Aegis missiles in Poland and Romania. They're a few minutes from Moscow. What are you putting in, in uh, those uh, missile chambers? We don't even know because you backed out of the ABM treaty, you backed out of the INF treaty. And so Putin's got a point. And now the US wants to move <laughs> up to the 2000 300 kilometer border with Russia. And for those who still think that this is, anyone who reads anything knows that this is a 30 years process. This is it's not about Putin reconstructing the, the Russian empire. <clears throat> That's a, a nice little joke told by the US security state, as opposed to any of the things I've just described. But if you just go online and look at the <clears throat> Russian uh, National Security Council meeting of February 21st, 2022, you get a perfectly plain explanation of what this military operation is about because Putin goes around the room and calls on everybody and calls on Lavrov, among others, and says, uh, Minister Lavrov, what is the situation with our proposals for security arrangements. And Lavrov says, Mr. President, we put them on the table and the United States has given us the formal notice that it will not negotiate on these points. And that as a formal principle, the United States will not discuss NATO enlargement with Russia because it's none of our business, because mm -hmm. that is the formal foreign policy doctrine of the United States of America. Well, mm -hmm. I can't think of a stupider one, by the way, mm -hmm. to say that NATO enlargement with all that it entails up to Russia's border is none of Russia's business. So we don't even discuss it with Russia. <clears throat> well, you might think a war could break out as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And it has. Yeah. Your colleague, Stephen Kotkin, I think Hoover Institution stand for the Russia historian. I talked to him in last, uh, last autumn in Berlin. And uh, he, of course, represents the other view. He says, Putin is an extremely dangerous guy and his regime follows a historical pattern in Russia, which is the uh, impotence and um, incapa incapacity of reforming the country. It gets more and more autocratic. And at the end, they are waging war. 
And this narrative that Putin is this highly dangerous guy who puts the opposition in prison, he is an aggressive um, um, dictator, it's an all-pervading view, even in reasonable circles in Switzerland. For example, if you talk to entrepreneurs, to, to people who have traveled the world, for them, just emotionally, this Putin is such a dangerous guy that they sympathize um, emotionally with this uh, uh, American containment policy or NATO enlargement policy. What would you say to these people who say, well, Professor Sachs, I mean, he's locking up uh, the opposition. He's a he's an autocrat. He has become a dictator. It's a terrible regime. We have to um, stop this man. Well, I think it is a, a relatively authoritarian regime, but that doesn't mean that it is uh, one that is uh, out to make war <clears throat> in uh, its uh, neighborhood. It's Russia that was invaded by the West so many times and by all these wonderful democracies. <laughs> so this idea that uh, you know Russia's uh, authoritarian and therefore militaristic and we're democracies and therefore is peaceful is preposterous. The most violent country in the world in the 19th century by far was Britain, uh, the most democratic, but uh, it used its internal democracy to cheerlead uh, building a global empire. The United States has been engaged in more wars than any other country since 1950. We're a democracy, but we're completely violent in overthrowing dozens of governments, in launching wars of choice all over the world, in having 800 military bases uh, overseas. So it's simple minded to say, oh, well, that's just a Russian tradition. Yeah, Russian tradition is to have been invaded by Napoleon. Russian tradition has been to have been invaded by Britain and France in the first Crimean War, which is, by the way, was fought on exactly the same principles as this war is fought, because the idea of Palmerston was blockade Russia in the Black Sea, destroy its uh, military capacity, naval capacity in the Black Sea, surround Russia in the Black Sea, and Russia doesn't threaten our empire. That was Palmerston's idea, very clear. Uh, basically, he was the great imperialist of his age, and uh, he just wanted to go on, by the way, after uh, the fall of Sevastopol, in 1856, he wanted to go on to the Caucasus, just like uh, expanding NATO to Georgia, by the way. Same model. Brzezinski just took the uh, took the Palmerston model because geography doesn't change. Uh, and uh, Russia was invaded by Hitler uh, mm -hmm. and uh, suffered more loss than any other place on the planet. And then this is a long story, but the United States after World War II, instead of negotiating a peace arrangement with the Soviet Union, unilaterally decided to remilitarize Russia, uh, remilitarize Germany, excuse me. And Kennan was absolutely against this policy. Kennan said, just like Austria is neutral, if Germany is neutral, the Cold War can end. But mm -hmm. the United States didn't want it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of this phony history and the of, about uh, Russia's military history and so forth, Russia is a country that was constantly invaded from the outside, mostly from the West. Uh, but of course, uh, during the Golden Horde from the East, from the mm -hmm. Mongols. And the issue for Russia in the mindset of the state leaders of Russia is we are threatened at our borders, period. And so that's why Ukrainian neutrality is really a good idea. Because if you really want the history, the history is Russia is always looking for safe space because it's always worried about 
outside invasion coming in. And now with respect to Putin, the truth is, even with all of the bad behavior of the United States in the 1990s, Putin came in as a friend of Europe and the United States. And anyone that knows anything about the early years of the 2000s knows that to be true. And I know it firsthand. And I know many European leaders that had absolutely good, fruitful relations with Putin. And have I've you spoken. Met, have you met uh, President Putin? Also? Of course. Uh, yes. I don't what's have. your impression? What's your personal? I mean, you met Gorbachev. I, I, met yeah. I really loved Gorbachev. Uh, I, I wouldn't say the same about Putin, but I don't know him. But Gorbachev I loved because uh, he was really a man of peace. Uh, and uh, Yeltsin, I liked. Uh, I wish he had stayed sober more often. Uh, it would have uh, really helped the world. Um, but he wanted normalcy, and I wanted to help him get that. And the United States just could not take yes for an answer on either case. Uh, the United States attitude was, they're on the other side. We're the sole superpower. We beat them. We can do what we want. That's the arrogance that has gotten us into this complete mess. And all these claims about, about Putin being intrinsically dangerous, European leaders absolutely can tell. They were working with him fruitfully in, for many, many years. And Europeans cheated, <laughs> cheated repeatedly. Where's the Minsk II agreements? Even Merkel says so. I mean, it's shocking what she said. I don't even believe it. Uh, in, in the way she said it, it was so garish. But you in mean any this, event, this quote in Die Zeit where she said, "Yeah, I, I think it's we just wanted to buy time to." Be yeah, I think I, I think it was working. taken a little bit out of context because she's not so cynical, actually, uh, from all my experience. But but the idea that Putin's all bad and we're all wonderful—that's our narrative every day. That's so deadly mainly for Ukraine, because it's so phony. I talked, I was in uh, in Moscow a few months ago. I talked to a lot of people and I had uh, some interesting conversations. And one um, eminent scholar told me, you know, Putin has been too trustful of the West for too long. He was a, he was a Westernized leader. And I, that was this man, I criticized Putin all the time for not being enough pro-Russia. He was too much pro-West. Is that a, an impression you have that Putin was really a guy who put his hopes into the trustfulness, trustworthiness of the West? Well, I think Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and Putin all did that. And this is a question for, uh, you know, Gorbachev uh, um, and NATO enlargement. There's no question that uh, Gorbachev was told over and over again by James Baker, by Hans Dietrich Genscher, uh, by uh, uh, the Secretary General of NATO, we won't move one inch. We will mm -hmm. never take advantage of you. And then he, he didn't put it in writing. Uh, he really didn't put it in writing, but there's a huge amount in writing in, in the uh, Western mm -hmm. archival material about all the promises that were made, and they were all blown off immediately. Mm -hmm. So the West was really untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. And then in 1999, NATO bombed Serbia on a ruse because it is a ruse. And if you really go to the deep story of the bombing and uh, and uh, the actually the internal competition between Madeleine Albright and, uh, and uh, um, Richard Holbrook about who was gonna be Secretary mm -hmm. of State in the next administration, who could be tougher. Oh, it's unbelievable. We bombed Serbia for weeks. And that was a little bit of a downer, but even then, Putin stayed with us. Then in 2002, the United States unilaterally walked away from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Even mm -hmm. then, Putin stayed with us. I think the final blow was, was basically 2008, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, NATO 
business uh, in, uh, in the Bucharest summit. I think that was uh, really the end of of mm -hmm. any trust. But he went ahead with the uh, you know uh, with Minsk, and uh, I think he believed that the Normandy process of Germany and France would stand up and actually do something. Mm -hmm. And we oh. know that behind the scenes, it was the Minsk agreement was completely blown off by all of the powers that be. So <laughs> I, I think that there are a lot of Russians who just uh, view this completely the opposite of the way that we are fed uh, mm -hmm. in uh, in the Western media. I don't think you have to view it all one way or all another way, but you do have to step back and understand the history of this. And the most fundamental point I would make is Ukraine should be neutral, should have remained neutral, mm -hmm. should have, uh, and we should have listened to a valid Russian red line. And I will emphasize both red line and a valid one. We would never tolerate uh, Mexico joining a military alliance with China or Russia, no matter what open door, what principles, what never. And it's perfectly understandable that Russia also would not tolerate this. And by the way, again, just to beat uh, what should be obvious <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to completion, Bill Burns, who is a very intelligent person and now our CIA director. Ambassador course, in Moscow. Yeah, in 2008, he wrote the clearest possible memo. Niet means niet. Don't do this, NATO enlargement. It's not just Putin. It's the entire Russian political class. Everybody objects to it. The academics, the scholars, the scientists, the politicians, the pro-Putin side, the anti-Putin side, everybody is against this. And as typical for the US, first of all, the memo was secret, so the American people were never told anything. Second, it uh, was only revealed by uh, Assange, uh, by WikiLeaks. Uh, so that's why we have to lock up Assange, <laughs> because uh, he told Americans the truth. Third, even when it's there now for everyone to read, because you can just go Google it uh, and read it, the New York Times wouldn't dream of mentioning it in all of the commentary about this war uh, since uh, 2014, Amazing. much less since 2021. Amazing. Going back to the war, how big is the chance of a nuclear escalation or some other forms of escalation, for example, if the um, Ukrainian forces would really crumble, would NATO, would the Americans just stand by and let uh, Putin win this war? And on the other hand, uh, do you see any perspective of uh, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, you know, deployment by the Russians? How is the escalation danger of this war at the moment? When Obama talked about escalatory dominance of Russia, he meant that if Russia were imperiled, it would escalate to nuclear war. I believe that to be true. And it's been said countless times now by Medvedev, by other Russian leaders, uh, in uh, not, not so hidden terms by Putin, and so on. If Russia were deeply endangered, it would escalate and up to and including uh, nuclear weapons uh, used in Ukraine. Uh, if Russia were to lose Crimea or to be threatened to be overrun in Crimea, which is the direct war aim right now of Ukraine, probably not achievable and its uh, uh, infeasibility probably keeps the world alive uh, because if it were feasible uh, or if the United States and uh, UK somehow made it feasible through uh, 
say, uh, NATO uh, jets uh, directly flying missions uh, to support uh, Ukrainian infantry, something that's not unthinkable, um, there would be a real chance of nuclear escalation. This is clear. The barrier between non-nuclear and nuclear is not very bright, is not a very bright line, history has told us repeatedly. Uh, we have come close to nuclear war on several occasions, and there are generals in the U.S. who believe in using nuclear war. We don't have a no first strike policy. Uh, and Russia is on uh, tenterhooks about the possibility of being attacked. So terrible accidents can happen, miscalculations can happen, or massive failures on one side or another can happen. And right now, it seems less likely be, that uh, it would be a result of a collapse of the Russian military that would lead to this. You raise a very good question, what if Ukraine were to collapse on the other side, which is a real possibility? What would uh, the West do? Uh, and by the West, all we mean ever is the US security establishment, because there is no other independent voice except the UK standing and cheerleading, whatever the US says, do 10 times more because uh, they still love their empire. Um, but uh, that would be a real question. And, and my, my uh, answer to that would be that I would hope that Russia would have some forbearance uh, and uh, know to stop before uh, provoking something extraordinarily dangerous, because then it would be in Russia's hands. And there's a wonderful quote, uh, which I'm just looking up right now, a famous line from Kennedy's famous uh, peace speech on June 10, 1963. He said, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcies of our policies or of a collective death wish for the world. And I, I may have garbled a, a word or two, we can correct it in the, <laughs> but, but the point is um, what I, find remarkable about that statement, and I've not only studied that speech <laughs> relentlessly, but wrote a book about it, actually. Kennedy talks a lot about all the dangers, but he says, above all, and in saying above all, he really means above all, avert those confrontations which put a nuclear power at the choice of a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. And we don't seem to understand that almost at all. Mm -hmm. Or there are enough cheerleaders that say, oh, it's a bluff. Uh, don't worry about that. Don't, don't be black, nu nuclear blackmail, and so on. Kennedy's telling us something extraordinarily important. He lived through the missile crisis. He, and Khrushchev enabled the world to survive that crisis. And what he's telling us above all is avoid such confrontations. And the US is incompetent in this right now, in that I'm told when I complain to senior politicians in Washington about the dangers they tell me privately, no, 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 Jeff, believe me, we're telling the Ukrainians, uh, you know, don't take back uh, Crimea. That's not that's not the U.S. goal and so forth. That's what I hear, quote unquote, privately. But of course, the Ukrainian goal is we're going to take back every inch, including Crimea and so on. So who's telling the truth in this? The answer is nobody knows because it's all a large group of people each playing their own game 
Hmm. It's extraordinarily dangerous what's going on. Could it escalate to nuclear war? It damn sure that it could, without question. What is, just to nail it down, what is at the moment, in your eyes, what does Putin want? What is his primary objective or what is his goal at the moment, if you would try to characterize that? What does he want now? I think he wants uh, Russian security. He wants to make sure that NATO never comes close uh, to uh, the border with Ukraine. Uh, he wants uh, Biden to say that so that this isn't uh, and to be part of a globally recognized commitment. Um, and he wants to hold Crimea for sure. Uh, and what's now, you know, uh, harder to assess is territorially, what about the rest? Because after, again, losing tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people, who knows, uh, at what was not originally a territorial uh, war, uh, we don't know what, uh, we, don't, we don't know what it is exactly right now. Uh, the, the Russians have just said again a couple of days ago that their aims are uh, no NATO enlargement, uh, holding the territories that they've annexed, which mm -hmm. means uh, the four regions uh, together with the Crimea and denazification of the Ukrainian government, whatever specifically that means. What do I think is at the core of this? I think at the core of this is, uh, as, as I keep saying, one is the Russian border and NATO. That, to my mind, is the most decisive mm -hmm. element of all. Second is Crimea, which is never going mm -hmm. back. And interestingly, just as, and, and third mm -hmm. is something about the rest of the territories. I don't think that Kherson and Zaporizhia are, you know, profound issues for Russia, though they now mm -hmm. have been annexed uh, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, the Donbass is much more complicated. What was on the table a year ago was much better than what's on the table, uh, what is mm -hmm. easy to achieve in negotiations now. What was on the table in December 2017 would have kept Ukraine basically whole except for Crimea and peaceful. And that's mm -hmm. what should have been accepted <laughs> at that mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. because the agreement was there to be made. And that's when I begged the White House, <laughs> negotiate now because what Putin is saying is absolutely mm -hmm. reasonable within, uh, uh, within uh, um, our negotiating mm -hmm. uh, sphere. What does President Biden want? What would you say is the primary goal of the United States government? Right now, he wants to win re-election. Mm. I think that's the primary goal. The second goal is... Uh, Not well, losing let, face in the Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's put it this way. Obviously, Ukraine is not a existential issue for the United States. Uh, it's not even close to the issue that it is for Russia. So what does the United States really want? Uh, Biden, first of all, wants to win re-election. So, so many of our wars are paced by the political cycle. This is the most basic point. And just like the Vietnam War kept going on and on and on because there was always an election coming, uh, mm -hmm. This is the, the main point. Second, of course, Biden wants the United States to stand tall and lead the free world. Uh, so uh, he doesn't, you know, in principle, we got a lot of people in the U.S. political class who really believe, uh, hell, no one can tell us what to do, where to go, where NATO should go. We don't have to listen to any of them. Uh, and then there's a group that really believes, I think it's almost a kind of madness, but I mean, it is a kind of madness. 
we got to stand st tall in Ukraine because we have to send a strong signal to China. That's actually a group. That's actually a view by people who are chronologically grownups, uh, mm -hmm. although intellectually, I would say mm -hmm. disgraceful uh, mm -hmm. because the confusion on these issues is so unbelievably huge. But that's also another view. But what mm -hmm. does Biden really want right now? He wants to get out of this without uh, losing political mm -hmm. support. Yeah. That's what he really wants. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Victoria Newland before. She said that she was kind of happy about the, the blow up of the uh, the pipelines, the, the Nord Stream pipelines. You uh, commented this as well. What's your current um, assessment of this? Who who blew them up? Um, do you um, agree with the, uh, the the research by Seymour Hirsch about the the United States involvement and that the U.S. actually played a huge role in that? Uh, blowing up uh, the, the pipelines? It's amazing that there are only two theories on the table right now. Uh, there's Seymour Hersh's theory, and then the story that the US government is propounding is that it was the Ukrainians and that the US knew about it. So either way, it's absolutely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, either way, the US knew about it and didn't stop it. Uh, if the Ukrainians did it, almost surely the US helped them technically to do it. And it's the US now that's saying it's the Ukrainians. Even our intelligence community doesn't say it's the Russians, doesn't even try to peddle the falsehood that it's the Russians. They actually peddle the story that it's the Ukrainians. Mm. And of course, <laughs> the media don't say anything about that, say, that's a puzzle. Well, what, what would the implication of that be? I, I testified in the UN Security Council saying that there should be an independent investigation. The United States said, no, we don't need that. Then I read in the New York Times, yeah, the US says it's Ukraine. Well, then we really do need an investigation of, of what happened. So mm -hmm. the whole thing is... Um, if you ask me what I believe, I believe Seymour Hirsch. Uh, mm -hmm. But even if I take the alternative, it's awful enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so either way, the US is implicated in this. We haven't heard a word of truth. And uh, it's so sad that nobody in Europe, especially in Germany, which has been hammered by this, raises a serious question at the or I shouldn't say that, uh, those members of the Bundestag that tried to raise a serious question were brushed off with the back of the hand, that how dare you ask us a question like that? This is a matter of state security, which means uh, we, don't want to t we don't want to tell tales about our American allies. What does it say about the UN Security Council, uh, even the United Nations, the Security Council doesn't want to go into that? I mean, I thought it was absolutely shocking uh, to hear that even the UN, which should, which should represent, you can say, humanity or, yeah. you know, all the parties, that they refrained from investigating this, I mean, amazing terrorist attack. I mean, it's there have no, not been dead people, but I can't remember that any kind of vital infrastructure has been attacked in such a severe way. And this institution just says, no, we don't go into that. Is that not just complete moral, intellectual and UN bankruptcy? Well, remember that when it comes to the UN Security Council, it's, it's actually 15 governments. It's not the UN as an institution. Uh, it is 15 governments five of which are the UN's general general secretary not intervene I mean if you are a, a UN general secretary you have some kind of moral standing and yes. you should say I mean this is not right we should um, otherwise I mean this is not the UN for all the great powers it's just the UN for the United States and for its allies I think what all of this war shows is that the UN is really in a in a damaged state when it comes to war and peace. 
because of the way that the Security Council functions. And uh, I have uh, my modest proposal taken from uh, the principles of, uh, of the Catholic Church, and that is that uh, we should lock them in a room, uh, the 15 members, and tell them that uh, they cannot come out uh, until there's white smoke over the 38th floor and they have uh, negotiated an end to this war. That's their job. They're not doing their job at all, not even remotely doing their job, not even seeing it as their job. And that is really a dire warning for the world, actually. It Does is it the job. It is the job of the UN Security Council to negotiate. But what I've observed is there are no negotiations. There's only speeches to the camera right now. And it's only taken as a game for the news cycle. It's not discussions. It's not negotiations. And it is very dangerous that it operates like that. Is there any international institution left which could function as a forum which is accepted by all the warring parties. I mean, the UN is definitely out of the question. The loss of credibility, according to me, is huge um, due to this behavior you just described. But is there any international institution left that could bring, that could fix this uh, terrible situation? No, but what there is, is uh, a phone call between Biden and Putin that could end this. And I keep offering to give them a Zoom link if they want to talk to each other. Uh, they could borrow my cell phone. Uh, the biggest disappointment of, well, maybe that's a strange way to put it, uh, a profound uh, re reality of this war is that since February 24th, 2022, Putin and Biden have not spoken one time, not even one time. All they have to do is send a Zoom link. They could talk with each other, even if they disagree. This is unbelievably, uh, unbelievably uh, irresponsible of Biden, first of all, in my opinion, uh, but uh, of the two, talk yeah. with each other, that's all disagree, yell at each other, but talk with each other because you can't end the war without talking. And this is a war between the US and Russia. Of course, it's the Ukrainians dying, but this is a war between the US and Russia. In uh, one of your podcasts, uh, very impressive about the uh, Kennedy free, um, speech, the, the peace speech you mentioned before, you said that the one crucial element was that Kennedy and Khrushchev were talking to each other. They installed even this telephone line. I have a photograph of that telephone here in my office, the most important communication device of humanity. Um, if, we, if I take this, I get the impression that we have a tremendous leadership crisis, especially in the West. We have a, a leadership in the West who is living in a, cert, in, a, in, a, in a way of a bunker or in a cave where they seem to be hypnotized by their own uh, images of the uh, other side, of the enemy, and they start to believe their own cave paintings in their caves, you know, to use this, this metaphor. Yes. And, and, and a lot of friends of mine and, and colleagues say, we really have a, a, a leadership crisis in the West. And can you comment on that? I mean, you I can. You if you, yeah, if you sure. give me a moment, let me get a book down off my shelf. Hold on. Of course, of course. This book is called The, uh, the Kennedy Khrushchev Letters. Mm -hmm. When uh, Kennedy became president, Khrushchev sent him a congratulatory note. And Kennedy proposed, why don't we open a, a back channel communication? Uh, in text, it wasn't with the phone yet, and we'll write to each other. And I promise you, uh, Chairman Khrushchev, I will never make public anything. And only a few of my closest aides will see this. So we'll keep it very much 
just for myself and a few absolute close aides, and you can do the same, but let's have a channel of communication. And these letters are astoundingly interesting and important. Uh, there are uh, a large number of them. I don't remember the count. Uh, yeah, more than 100 of these. And uh, they're incredible to read. For example, I was uh, just uh, um, reviewing uh, after the US invaded Cuba in the Bay of Pigs in April 1961, Khrushchev wrote in the back channel to Kennedy, uh, you know, rogue elements of your government are committing uh, acts of piracy uh, in your name. And Mr. President, you need to stop this. And Kennedy wrote back uh, a disgraceful letter, actually, uh, one of the worst of his career, in my view. Uh, Mr. Khrushchev, this has nothing to do with us. Uh, this isn't really the United States, uh, so don't misinterpret. And Khrushchev wrote, so that was on uh, April 18, I think it is. And then Khrushchev wrote back basically to paraphrase, Mr. President, don't ever lie to me like that. This is an American action and don't talk to me like that. Uh, and you need to stop this international crime. And first of all, very human letters. Uh, Khrushchev sending the alarm, Kennedy brazenly lying, uh, Khrushchev responding, don't you dare lie to me. And they were off and running. And it was that relationship actually that saved the world in the end, because they were really talking with each other, sometimes deeply arguing. Uh, and of course, uh, at the uh, Vienna summit in 1961, Kennedy had a hard time as Khrushchev really uh, pounded on him. But they regarded each other as human beings and able to talk with each other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that makes a big difference in this world. Mm -hmm. And one of the absolute worst ideas, disgraceful ideas of American rhetoric is you can't talk to a person like Putin. Uh, that's like Munich 1938. So Munich 1938 supposedly teaches America never negotiate with the other side. That's appeasement. And that is actually one of the beliefs, deep beliefs in this uh, fantastical American foreign policy, uh, which is uh, even talking uh, is a is a terrible, terrible appeasement. And but this, yeah, but this strikes me as completely absurd because I mean, the Americans, the Germans, they were talking to the Soviets and whatever you can say about Putin. I mean, the Soviet Union had the gulag. The Soviet Union had of course, Stalin. and they, they were not only were they talking, they were much, making, but they were still talking to them. I they mean, were making arms agreements. Soviets, if you talk to Mao, you can talk to Putin. Putin is compared to a Mao. Putin is like a peace, no, a Nobel Prize, a peace a prize winner <laughs> compared to a guy like Mao or Stalin. And I mean, they were collaborating. They were working together against exactly. Hitler. No, That's, it's just it, it's so immature. Yeah. so misguided and i see it all around me uh, and by the way it leads to all these useless wars yeah. so it's not as if there are no consequences the mm -hmm. consequences are before our eyes yeah. this I is no way to have diplomacy that's what i was trying to tell these people in the white house behave if you yeah. behave you can avoid the war but at the end of the day one has to say to bringing in a fair account of events um, I share a lot of your views, uh, basically all of them. But one thing strikes me still. I think that Putin, there was a cer certain sense of recklessness. He thought he could get away with it as well. When he saw the Americans running in Afghanistan, he saw in, in uh, Berlin there is a new government with inexperienced people. Putin doesn't take seriously Macron in France. 
um, probably Putin extremely underestimated this kind of woke response, this kind of woke foreign policy, this emotional foreign policy that the whole West or basically, I mean, the Americans um, would strike back so hard that they would defend the Ukraine. Don't you see a certain sense of megalomania on the side of Putin as well when he went into uh, the Ukraine? No, I wouldn't say megalomania, but what I would say is that each side is playing a game of chicken and each side has uh, underestimated the response on the other side no. uh, because the U.S. thought it could get away with everything just in 2014. Uh, it would be enough to throw Yanukovych out and now mm -hmm. we'll, you know, we'll have a pro-Western government and we'll do everything we want to do. They miscalculated Putin grabbed Crimea. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, in 2021, Putin thought massing uh, the troops on the border would be enough to get uh, Biden to negotiate. By the way, mm -hmm. it should have been <laughs> there was mm -hmm. because the terms for the negotiation were perfectly plain and reasonable, but uh, it didn't work. Uh, then Biden thought, OK, it's a bluff. Uh, don't, Putin will not do this. Okay, Putin then called the bluff thinking, you know what, we'll force them to the, the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, within days, they, Zelensky was at the negotiating table. He was tweeting about neutrality in exactly. April. Zelensky was tweeting. No, but, but as, as, early as, could be exactly, as early as March, just a few days right. after the start. So that was Putin's idea. Okay, then, no, then Biden said, no, 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 uh, the sanctions will kill them. Uh, and so I remember I spoke to people in the U.S. Treasury, oh, it's going to be devastating, you know. Uh, so they thought that would uh, blow off Putin. Each side has been uh, doing this. Then, you know, they thought, okay, Putin will never mobilize politically, the backlash and so forth. Then he mobilized a few hundred thousand additional troops in the summer of 2022. So this is a game of chicken with escalation. Mm -hmm. And the, the fundamental problems with it are what Obama noted in 2014, which is Russia has escalatory dominance, mm -hmm. which is that for Russia, this is existential. For mm -hmm. the United States, it's incidental. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is the fundamental problem with the Western position. And that's why we're in a disaster. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest puzzle in all of this is, for me, it's not even a puzzle anymore, but it's a, the biggest tragedy is Ukraine doesn't have the wherewithal to recognize that it needs to save itself. Mm -hmm. from this game of these two escalating superpowers. Is, Zelensky, and, is President Zelensky, who is almost uh, depicted as a saint in our media, isn't Zelensky an extremely irresponsible leader of his country? He will be regarded in history as a disaster, absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting that that the moment at the moment it's the total opposite, but I notice the atmosphere is changing. People are losing a bit their patience with him. But I mean, I took so much time of you, but I would like if you allow me. I would. If like Zelensky had just followed through in March 2022, yeah, he would have done his job for his country. But the United States intervened and said, no, no, don't make that agreement. And he went with the U.S. and that's where he failed. Yeah. Allow me to put uh, the global perspective to the last part of the interview. I, I don't want to take too much of your precious time, but it's so interesting. Um, do we enter a new chapter in current history? Meaning 30 years ago, the fall of the Iron Curtain globalization, free trade, an explosion of wealth, development of uh, backwater countries. I mean, you are a development economist. A lot of uh, countries gained a lot of wealth due to this interconnectivity or whatever you want to call it. 
And now we are entering what I would call an absurd version of a Cold War. Mm-hmm. Is you that know, ahead or is that uh, um, hyperbole? We, uh, we don't know what kind of world we're entering yet. Uh, what I believe is that the underlying reality is we're already in a post-American and post-Western world. We're in a truly multipolar world. We're in a world where the BRICS countries are larger than the G7 countries. Uh, we're even in a Turkey world... wants to join, even Turkey and yes. uh, Greece want to join the BRICS, uh, the BRICS countries. So in my view, we've already moved to uh, a, a world in which the underlying economic, demographic, and technological capacities mean that this is not the world of the 19th and 20th century dominated by the West, but this is a, a, a bigger world uh, with uh, multiple uh, major powers in it. And one of the points of all of this is the United States does not accept that transition. Uh, the United States still believes that this is uh, ultimately a US-led world. Uh, with two recalcitrant actors, Russia and China, and all the rest will come along to understand the realities. And the U.S., in my opinion, is uh, a quarter century out of date. Uh, but uh, being at the institutions of uh, American power, Harvard and, uh, and uh, the East Coast of the U.S., I know what people say and think and talk, and I think they're just a quarter century out of date. So that is uh, our big geopolitical challenge is that the mental models of the major powers and the realities are not aligned. And Europe is a big disappointment in this because uh, there isn't one voice in Europe right now uh, that has a geopolitical uh, 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 outlook that is really, even intelligible, uh, basically. Uh, so th- this is, to me, uh, both natural that uh, this is a war that shows the limits of uh, American power, which are not the world leader, but a very powerful country among many, um, or among, among a few at least. And the biggest surprise is the incapacity of Europe to have a coherent understanding of the situation. But what kind of world we're heading towards really uh, is an open question because we could be heading towards a a world of massive conflict and disaster, or we could actually head towards a world where some intelligent, non-octogenarian, leader in the United States arises and says, you know, NATO, ah, we don't need it so much anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. But what we do need is to have normal relations with China, with India, uh, with Russia, with Brazil, with the EU. And then suddenly things would look really quite different. Uh, so it, where we're heading is, is not, I believe, uh, either set in stone or even easily predictable. We have this geopolitical crisis. We have a a technology disruption, which is profound. We have an ecological disruption, which is profound. And how we manage this is the biggest question. And the war in Ukraine is a tragic sideshow to the big issues, Mm -hmm. but in a way, I sometimes compare it to uh, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest uh, in 9 AD. Uh, You know, uh, uh, Augustus learned in 9 AD, okay, the Roman Empire, it's big, but we don't have to actually go all the way into into Germania. Uh, Maybe we'll just stop here. And it's a good lesson, by the way, because the Roman Empire did quite well for centuries yeah. onward without having to continue to try to conquer uh, the German tribes. And um, 
I think this is kind of a Teutoburg forest for the US or should be seen as one, which is okay. That's the limit of NATO enlargement. Uh, th these are the new uh, limits. Uh, this is the lines of uh, of Europe now. It uh, extends uh, uh, through Eastern Europe, but it doesn't go uh, across to Moldova, Belarus, Ukraine, and so on. And now let's learn to live in such a world. What do you say um, to people who uh, who describe the, the situation right now as a global conflict between between democracies and autocracies, and China being the ultimate enemy of the West. When I first heard that, I regarded it as worse than a kindergarten, uh, <laughs> a kindergarten story. I could not believe a president of the United States would say such an idiotic thing uh, to see that it's part of uh, actual US foreign policy discourse is to show what the, I think the failings of American higher education are. Uh, but it could not be stupider mm -hmm. period yeah and let's talk am i being clear <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk for a moment about the united states i mean we we read a lot of uh, disquieting news for example you have homeless uh, a lot of homeless people in some cities you have an explosion it seems of criminality you have a uh, in fighting in the political class, uh, extremely divided, the Democrats about, against the Republicans. What is your assessment of the United States? In what shape are the United States at the moment, which uh, still I have to say, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the US and the US has always been an inspiration uh, for Swiss people, of course, uh, for our family. But still, there are some disturbing uh, news uh, one reads. But what is your your impression yeah. uh, as an American and uh, inside? Ba ba basically, for the last 40 years, the U.S. has not been uh, able to reach uh, uh, any kind of uh, social democratic agreement on any issue that of society's problems. Uh, so by that, I mean, what, what happened if, roughly 40 years ago, the U.S. political system was completely hacked by lobbying and campaign contributions. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court opened the, opened the doors to uh, the massive corruption of the U.S. political system. So all of our politics are in the hands of powerful uh, groups. Uh, finance is in the hands of Wall Street. Uh, the healthcare sector is in the hands of uh, the uh, big uh, health uh, insurance industry. Uh, the energy sector is in the hands of uh, big oil to a very large extent. The foreign policy is in the hands of the military industrial complex. It's all been parceled out. Uh, and the problem is not polarization in between red and blue states. Uh, it's not uh, the tribal divisions uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats. Basically, both parties serve their campaign financiers. They're the same for both parties. Uh, we're pretty deeply entrenched in all of our politics right now. Nothing changes mm -hmm. year to year. And the social conditions underlying the society uh, get have deteriorated markedly uh, over the last 30 years, predictably. Mm -hmm. And the best gauge of that deterioration is that our life expectancy now is uh, around the level of 1996. Uh, so we've had a decline of several years of life expectancy. It's uh, 76 years. Uh, according to the most recent uh, calculations. And that shows a society that is really in bad political health as well as social uh, health. Uh, and uh, I live in New York City. It's uh, filled with garbage and homelessness right now. Uh, I mean, just the management of the city on a daily basis is a, is a big is a much bigger challenge than it was 20 years ago. 
Uh, and, and, and it's obvious the things to do because Europe does most of them and, and the United States can't do anything because the rich people who pay for the government don't want to pay taxes and that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, we, we're just paralyzed uh, in this. And when the Democrats are in office, nothing happens. And when the Republicans are in office, nothing happens. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's, that's really where we are on our social politics and it's not red and blue states that's a kind of game of daily uh social media it's very uninteresting the politics actually it's very clear very predictable and very much hacked what do you think of of donald trump i mean is he is he a man who could make america great again or is he no. a danger for american democracy Look, uh, Biden is a danger for American democracy. Trump is a danger for American democracy. Uh, what are we doing with octogenarian leaders right now? Uh, period. Uh, I'm aghast at the Biden administration. I was aghast at the Trump administration. I was profoundly disappointed with the Obama administration. I was absolutely aghast at the, uh, at the uh, Bush Jr. administration. During my whole lifetime, there's been one president that I think uh, bears uh, high respect, uh, and that's John Kennedy. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he made his early blunders, and then he became a great man, and then they killed him. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, beyond that, Johnson, no thank you. Nixon, no thank you. Gerald Ford, mm. uh, Jimmy Carter's very nice man very uh, not effective. Uh, Ronald Reagan, no thank you. Uh, George Bush Sr. <clears throat> had his moments and, and then dropped the ball. Clinton was uh, <clears throat> really uh, <clears throat> so amateurish and dilettante uh, in governance. Uh, George Bush Jr. was a disaster. Uh, uh, Obama was, those eight years went by and nothing happened. Uh, he was, you felt he wouldn't do something completely awful, and he didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. He was level-headed, but didn't lead to any change because the system mm -hmm. is just blocked. Yeah. Trump, completely unstable, and Biden, an octogenarian neocon. You know, what, what, what more could you want? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> what, what does it say about the American political system that you have still in the in the polls a highly rated former president who is attacked by by um, attorneys uh, who is involved in a in a whole uh, uh, array of of, of 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 criminal law I mean criminal cases I, I I follow this you know from a lot of distance but I think it's always a bit a dangerous symptom if political fights are, you know, fought uh, on the courts, you know, that they start of to course. attack. Of uh, course. How, how do you assess that? I mean, how? what does it stand for? What kind of... It, what, what it means, that? you know, the, the main thing is uh, Americans do not trust their institutions anymore. Mm -hmm. That's That's the dominant fact. Americans do not trust their institutions. And the reason is government operates by lies. And that's terrible. And if you do that pervasively, you end up with the Congress with a, a, a trust uh, rating of 10% of the public, something like that. Uh, and this collapse of trustworthiness started with the assassination of President Kennedy uh, and the lies that were told about it. And then it was followed by Watergate and Vietnam War and one war after another based on lies. And so the American people are deeply unhappy. The political system has proven to be corrupted and unable to reform itself. And the main lesson I would take from this is uh, don't have a presidential system, by the way, you have a mm -hmm. parliamentary system. Uh, at least uh, you get uh, the parties have to discuss with each other and negotiate something. And it's a, a little bit more stable than what we have. Do you think that that the relationship between Russia and Europe is now 
destroyed for a very long time or can that be repaired in a foreseeable future? Not only can it be repaired, it will be repaired. Uh, and uh, it's it's a tip of, I want to read one more of my favorite lines from, uh, from Kennedy. When Kennedy spoke at uh, the uh, Irish Parliament in uh, July 1963, he said, uh, indeed, across the gulfs and barriers that now divide us, we must remember that there are no permanent enemies. Hostility today is a fact, but it is not a ruling law. The supreme reality of our time is our indivisibility as children of God and our common vulnerability on this planet. And this is very wise. There are no permanent enemies. Russia's not going away. It's 11 time zones. It's a major power in the world. It is a trading country. It is a European country. It is part of European culture and history. And all that's said right now, for example, the New York opera canceling a Russian soprano uh, because of the war. This is happening, but it's mindlessly stupid and it will be short lived. And it's important to remember that in the Crimean War, and this is the second Crimean War, it's, it's, it's just the second Crimean War. Uh, in the first Crimean War, uh, which ended in 1856, by 1871, pretty sure it's by 1871, uh, France and Russia were allies again uh, because of the rise of Germany. Uh, and so, uh, you know, time to change partners again. Uh, and so uh, what had been this you know, dramatic fight in Palmerston wanted to end Russia uh, and dismember Russia. Uh, soon, uh, France and, and Russia were allies and France was pumping finance into Russia again. So this is not the end of anything, uh, of course, and it should come back much sooner than people think. A bit, bit out of context, a very short question. How do you interpret this uh, coup in Niger? What what's what is this about? Is this a new uh, kind of uh, what it, what is it uh, an, an African uh, awakening or a, what what is it? Is it yeah, just I a think local it's, event? Uh, or? I, I think it is. Uh, it it is um, clearly three things. Uh, one is it's poverty because the Sahel is impoverished and impoverished places where I've been working for more than forty years. They're unstable. And so this is, and I have always said, by the way, the number of speeches I've given to say, we need a program for the Sahel, you know, to help uh, mm -hmm. water, <laughs> food, uh, and so forth. Okay, so that's one part. Second, it's clearly, uh, you know, uh, the, the end of the French uh, role. We're, we're still in the final waves of decolonization in West Africa uh, and uh, remaining French privileges are gonna be pushed aside. Uh, it took longer time because of the poverty basically, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this, is a, this really is an anti-colonial uh, mm -hmm. action and it finds a lot of support on the street, uh, definitely. And you see it that it's not just Niger, it's Burkina, it's Mali, uh, and it's anti-French for sure. A good sign, a good, a good uh, in that sense, a good development. It, it's a, it, it is a, what happened in every part of the world, but it's happening later in Africa because the dependency was higher, uh, the poverty was higher. And yeah. then the third part is it quickly became within two days a new geopolitics because of Wagner and Russia and everything else. So it's dangerous. And mm -hmm. what the right answer to this, actually, which... I <laughs> uselessly proposed this immediately was, how about an economic development program for the Sahel? Uh, mm. God forbid people should live with the chance of, uh, uh, with some chance. And as usual, nobody, and I, I will push this in the UN for whatever it's worth, but 
the normal response is uh, this has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. uh, this has where the army is going to be. Will ECOWAS in intervene? If you want, it, it doesn't even matter right now uh, who's in charge. It doesn't matter really uh, how the politics is. What matters is these are places of hunger, of drought, of lack of infrastructure, of lack of schooling, of uh, no budgets, and we should do something about it because people should not live in that condition. Let's end on an optimistic note. I mean, uh, after the bleak outlook in the American uh, uh, situation and, and other world affairs, who's the, the politician actually at the moment who inspires you with a certain uh, positive feeling? Who would you think could be in a role of, 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 of making the situation better? Who could calm the tense situation of the world right now? I, I'm taking a pretty uh, naive, uh, basic view of this, which is that we set certain goals for humanity, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And for me, those are the best hopes that we have, actually, not the politicians, not the political class, but the idea that uh, even in all of this confusion, humanity has said, here's the future we really need. Here's the future we want. And so I spend my own time trying to uh, keep the idea of this global cooperation to achieve the things we really need to attend to, like uh, the climate system or uh, getting kids in school and so forth as our best hope. It, it's a different kind of politics. I'm not counting on some political leader to save us. Uh, I'm not even counting on our normal daily politics to work. I'm hoping that we can set our sights on real objectives that we need in this planet because they're very serious right now. The climate issue is really serious. Uh, the uh, ecological challenges are really serious. Uh, the poverty challenges are really serious, like in the Sahel where we're gonna have coup after coup after coup after coup if people live in complete destitution, which is the condition in Mali or uh, or uh, Niger or Burkina Faso. So we should set our sights on what we really need to do and tell the politicians, look, that's your job. We're not here for your purpose. I don't give a damn about your reelection. Do your job. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is my view about how we need to change politics. One can say, the human beings are not stupid. Human beings make a lot of errors, of course. They they err all the time, and, uh, and sometimes they make terrible mistakes. But generally, our species is uh, adaptable, and exactly everybody By strives, the way. and everybody strives for the positive. And the famous uh, historian, the English historian H. A. P. Taylor, once wrote, "the The peoples are often more intelligent than their leaders." So I would translate your uh, final statement as uh, your optimism grounds on the uh, swarm intelligence of the people or of the, the, the inner striving of the people to, to create the positive and to cooperate and to gain wealth. And just to add one, one more point, we are in the midst of one of the greatest scientific advances in history. And we have tools that are more powerful than ever before. So there's no challenge that we're facing, whether it's on the energy system or on schooling or on access to healthcare uh, or on uh, decent urban environment, where we're bereft of solutions. We've got the best, most powerful solutions imaginable. Mm -hmm. we've, we've got a world economy of $100 trillion a year uh, at market prices and at purchasing adjusted prices of $160 trillion a year. So what's our problem? Our problem is not our lack of means. 
Our mm. problem is not that we're doomed. Our problem is that uh, we are absolutely doing stupid things like asking who's number one, who's number two, which is the obsession of US strategists rather than asking what should we do to make the world decent, which is mm -hmm. the right question to ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor, thanks. Many thanks uh, for this, uh, for your time and for this interview. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.